Welcome back to this week's episode of Let Christy Take It. This week's episode is brought to you by FabWeddings.ie, the wedding and event hire company. Why not let Fab Weddings take the hassle out of your event planning with their comprehensive list of products and services? You can find them on Facebook at Fab Weddings and also at www.fabweddings.ie. And don't forget to mention Let Christy Take It. I'm sure they will take care of you. And I will definitely use them for my next wedding. Welcome to episode three of Let Christy Take It, our pop cultural podcast. Kieran here. Really enjoyed the feedback we got last week. Great to hear you all enjoyed the episode. Today's episode we're going to be more lighthearted, not as dark and dreary as Salem's Lot. We're going to focus on the 1980s, and it barely made it into the 80s, it's been made in 1989. Movie, say anything. So no scene in, in the late 80s cinema is more iconic than Lloyd Dobler. Uh, played by John Cusack, holding a boombox above his head with the song In Your Eyes blasting out in an attempt to win his girlfriend back. Cameron Crowe's directorial debut, also starring my only Sky and John O'Mahony. Ladies and gentlemen, say anything. A snippet there of uh, the Peter Gabriel, the iconic song from Say Anything. Um, anybody who knows the movie will immediately, hear, when they hear that song, will connect with it. Would you agree? Absolutely, absolutely. So the, the film Say Anything was released in April 1989 and it only it didn't make much money at all. It made about four million off it made about 21, 22 million off a 16 million budget. Um but upon release was greeted with unbelievable reviews by some very, very revered movie critics, uh, Siskel and Ebert, yeah. right, as their film of the year. Yeah. And the characters were so honest and true. And uh, we're going to spend the next hour just you know chatting about the film and, and uh, hopefully get you an interest in it. We will mention that this podcast is spoiler heavy. It was one of the criticisms we got from last week. So if you haven't seen the movie, we recommend you go see it uh, before listening. All, all our podcasts are going to contain spoilers. So I think we should just have that. Let Christy take it. It's going to spoil everything on you at the start because it will spoil it if you haven't seen it. But um, So if you haven't seen it, pause this, go watch it and then come back to us. So the three main characters in, in the film are uh, Lloyd Dobler, uh, uh, played by John Cusack, his future girlfriend, the, the, the love of his life, the one he, he dreams about, uh, Diane Court, played by the very beautiful um, Ioni Sky, and her father, played by John Mahoney. Yeah, Mahoney. Very, oh, if you're a police captain fan, Mahoney. Mahoney. Uh, very famous, well, very well known for playing the father of Fraser Crane in, in the sitcom Fraser. So the, the actors who were cast in them roles were they they weren't the initial start. So for the the role of Lloyd, who who was the first, or who was the first castings that they wanted to do it? Mm-hmm. I know Cusack was very hesitant to do well, it. Wasn't he, he? he was hesitant. He, there was a lot. Of, he was one of the names in the, in the frame, and he he just kind of pulled himself away from it straight away because I think he previous to that he made about four or five. Uh, high school movies yeah. you know he, he said he graduated yeah. five times before yeah. he even made he didn't it. want to graduate again he didn't screen. want to graduate again so the role was actually offered to Robert Downey Jr I think he would have been brilliant the role. and we could have had John Cusick as Iron Man imagine yeah. he's going to work different um, he, he he turned it down um, also names floated at the time where Peter Berg went on to be a very successful director yeah. Christian Slater yeah. but when John O'Mahony came on board as, as the, the father yeah. Um. Sorry, not O'Mahony. Mahony. He he read the script again. He you know he, he was very aware of John Cusack's ability and his his likability, and he he was the one that you know met with Cusack and said, "Read this again. You know, this is you. Let's get on board." You know, and, and Cusack. So okay. Cusack came on board and was uh, the only guy who her father is the folk singer Donovan and her mother is a model or I don't know they're still together Donovan Jennifer Juniper famous yeah, man, one, yeah. Of Hordy Hordy, one of my favourite Hordy Gordy man <laughs> yeah. was in the film uh, the, the generally uh, but so um, did she was she initially casting a role or was that somebody else in mind or um, no Elizabeth Shue okay. very much in the forefront to pay that but um, it came very very close but no she 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 um, you know, scraped the part. She, you know, came through. Very, very beautiful girl. Very yeah. tall. She said she was nothing like a character. Her character is a very academic, 
girl. Yeah, right? she, she said she wasn't like she wasn't. She grew up in kind of a hippie household, yeah. you know. Uh, she, for, not very scholastic. Can you name? I think she had kind of a thing for the rock and roll guys. Can you name her uh, husbands or boyfriends? I know she was married to a certain Beastie Boy. She was married to is it Durowitz? Adam Durowitz? Horowitz. 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 Yeah. I don't know it's set going around a class. I yeah. <laughs> can't imagine and, the basic basic uh, that. Was she married to Flea? Or went no, to Flea? No, I think it was one of the, was it Flea. It was one of the Red Hot Chili Peppers who had who their, their, used their music in the movie as well. So the opening song, To Say Anything, is a very, very early Chili Pepper song. Yeah, so we had to... And then the father, uh, John Mahoney, uh, he said that this was one of his most uh, awful roles to play. He loved playing this guy like such a bad so guy. Also not the first choice. No, really. So yeah. Dick Van Dyke oh, yeah. was very close to playing it. I don't. Dick Van Dyke didn't. I don't think like the fact that the, the father um, eventually was found guilty, and it was deemed that he was, you know, he was a, a very bad okay. character. And the script was sent to um, Rob Reiner. Was Rob also, Reiner. Yeah. Rob Reiner just wasn't acting. He very wasn't famous acting actor, yeah. director. Yeah. And um, Richard, what's the guy from Jaws? The guy with Schneider. No, Dreyfus. Richard Dreyfus. God, I don't know. I forgot that name. <laughs> Um, he, he loved it he sent it back and he said you know I, I love the script so much but what I want to do is I want to play Lloyd jokingly you know yeah and that was the gate of the Marsden house we haven't we've been trapped there since last week's podcast <laughs> um, but uh, iconic cast and I don't think the film would have been the same with, it, with other actors in those roles you know? but yeah you know we say that probably if, if uh, Downey Jr. had been in it holding that boombox up it was he we would be talking about him and they're all i think when when somebody especially like imagine the cry kid or one of these film iconic films without those people in it but we remember them from watching them if somebody else had been in the role i think it would have been just as good but well, they did they did do a good job there is a karate kid oh there's and that's a, that is a, a nice segue we're getting good at this yeah the, because it's the he he's a kickboxer and sport of the future sport of the future and uh lloyd is a kickboxer and the dojo that they used to fill in the scenes is the same dojo that was used for Cobra Kai dojo. Cobra Kai dojo. So uh, that's a little connection. And uh, the guy who's who breaks Lloyd's nose in the movie is Don the Dragon Wilson. Yeah. A very, very famous... Uh, and Cusack took up kickboxing after that, didn't he? He stayed out of... Yeah, yeah, for years. Actually, for years. Um, he trained with Benny Akita. Benny the Jet. Benny the Jet. Or something like that. Yeah. 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 So uh, a bit of a segue... One, another very famous John Cusack movie is Gross Point Blank. Brilliant film. And the hitman that he's fighting in the hallway of the school reunion is yeah. Benny the Jet. So that's probably one of my favourites. So like, we decided to do this movie, as you said, to lighten the mood. Um, not one of my favourite films of the 80s. I thought it was ones which were done better. I would be more of a fan of the John Hughes genre, and I thought he was the main man for those type of movies. We had like your pretty in pink, and to me, Derek, and I know we're, we're, this the table could be torn upside down here. This one, but to me, pretty in pink is the better of the two. Uh, look, you know, different folks, different strokes. Um, I personally, I adore the movie. Say anything. And I know we've had, we've spoken with this many times. You say that I have a maybe a you know an emotional connection to that song. I do. Yeah. It's one of my favorite songs of all time. It's also in one of my favorite movies of all time, which is a double whammy for me. And um, the, the the scene of John Cusack after being heartbroken, you know, absolutely heartbroken by his girlfriend breaking up with him, and you know, putting wearing his heart on his sleeve and standing up to his girlfriend's uh, bedroom blasting the song that they'd made love to a couple of weeks before in the car uh, blasting out the song in the hope that she would come to the window and say okay uh, the romeo and julia the romeo moment from the, yeah, the romanticized uh oh, and that's, that's what works the movies I, I can't imagine uh 1989 very many lads stand outside the bedroom window in Neil's town where i got a vast of bear player and people like, oh. absolutely not. <laughs> i mean there were such the, the characters were su- such contrast to each other Lloyd was very much a you know a flippant, very eccentric. I would say. Uh, very eccentric, actually. Yeah. Um, I mean, the clip of the party where he goes to a party with her and he's barely by her side, and he's flying around doing other things. He's, the, the, he's the, given the keys. Oh, the he's key the keyman. Key the the yeah. And do you know the Stoltz still goes to parties to this day and is handed back the keys. So he was Eric Stoltz. We're getting a bit off track. He's executive right? producer. Yeah, we, he was. Um, he was very good friends with Cameron Crowe, and if you look at some of the Cameron Crowe films. Eric Stoltz has little cameos in them. 
Yeah. You know, so he kept, he, and he, he also signed on as the production assistant of that movie. So he done the, the cameo as the key master as a favor and stayed on for like eight weeks just getting people coffee and you know getting them bagels if they wanted them in the morning okay, that's what but, i meant i said exactly producer production production Sorry. assistant yeah that's what he wanted it just to get some sort of experience and has gone on to be a very uh, you know well revered tv director as well as still acting you know if he had it made back to the future it would be no difference he was the original Marty he was McFly. the original marty mcfloy and also people don't realize this um that film was half made yeah it wasn't a week it wasn't two weeks it just was, it just didn't fit he just didn't fit yeah, yeah. So, anyway, uh, we, we digest. Like, sorry, we digest. We, we, and this, this will happen. Yeah. So there's such major, major contrast between them. Diane Court was the valedictorian of the high school of the year that they were finishing up in. Lloyd was very much, you know, very, you know, easygoing, you know, wearing his heart and sleeve, very carefree. She was, you know, had just gotten a scholarship to go to England. Well, the movie starts with the graduation and she makes this very, the speech. And doesn't she mention Back to the Future in the speech? You go back. To the future. Go back, yeah. Yeah, to the future. So there we are. I've connection. seen the future. I think we should go back. And the father talks hilarious. And he's yeah. only on the last course. But that's another back to the future connection there. But um, the character of Lloyd, I, I know Crow was struggling to get the idea of what he would be like in it for a while writing it, wasn't he? And James L. Brooks, who was the producer, was saying, look, you need to get something. What do you want to look like? What's he going to act like? And didn't he have a, a bit of a, a neighbour kind of introduce himself? So he had um, he, he major issues writing the character, you know, um, but he came inspired. He was living in um, Alabama, I think, you know, just getting himself sequestered himself away. And his neighbour had knocked in. His neighbour was very much the kind of lawyer that you see on the screen. He knocked in. How you doing? I'm your neighbour. I'm, I'm going to be here for a few weeks. What's your name? What are you doing? Crew cut. Um, I, I'm mad into kickboxing. Kickboxing. Sport of the future. Sport of yeah. the future. And that's Brooks. He, so he said that this was going on for a few weeks, and Brooks was I think he got a bit impatient and said, "Look, okay, have you come up with any ideas?" And he said, "No." And he said, "I'm going to tell you about this neighbour guy." And as you said, he introduced himself like that. And Brooks said, "And you're wondering what you need to write." So he said, to just, him, "Just write." It. But if you look at some of the Cameron Crowe films that he eventually made afterwards, that's what he does. He writes what he he knows. I mean, the, the movie Almost Famous is a, is a semi. Well, that would be one of that would be my favorite of his book. But that's him. That, but that is, is him. That yeah. is him. You yeah. know, writing yeah. for Rolling Stone at fifteen, going out on the road, rock stars. Yeah, and, and that's it, and, and basically living him. So this is based on his own youth, to a degree. Yeah, it, well, it's so, based on the fact that he was heartbroken. Didn't he say it's, it's a love story for those who can't say I love you? That was one of his quotes he said. Yeah, so he, he, you know, he was left heartbroken by a girl, and he poured all, you know, at the time, he poured all of his, his emotions. He would try to think back to when he was 19, and the guy's heart broke, and how he felt, and, you know, he put it on paper, and eventually put it on film. Yeah, so... We follow the track, he asks her out, she agrees, over the phone, probably his eccentric nature, maybe and maybe because the type of girl she was, a lot of lads would have been probably a bit intimidated to, yeah. to ask her to go out, and she probably didn't ask that much. So, uh, you, you know, she she rings him, and he goes, do you remember me? And he goes, oh, we sat opposite each other in the mall, oh, you remember? She says, no, my dad wrote it down, yeah, he, he must have told me that on the phone, yeah. so very unmemorable character obviously you know the she only agrees to go because she feels i think that you know she's gone away to england in a few weeks and you know she's going to be studying for her doctorate or whatever and you know that maybe she hasn't she hasn't done all the things that teenagers need to do yeah. before she goes because she, she goes to that party she seems to have a great time so, she's signing yearbooks and she's mingling with people and talking to people and that she probably would have never spoke to before yeah so i mean even when she agreed to the date she agreed to go she ran and gets her yearbook out and finds him in the yearbook and her face is not very <laughs> she's looking going, oh gee what the hell you know but uh, you say they, they go people are saying to him at the party what the hell but even uh, i was watching it last night and like she turns up as if she's going to a deb's and he's in this big mac and jeans and pair of runners like and you're saying like the yin and the yang the the, the, the oil and the paint you know, the, oil and the water. absolute contrast that like, the whole yeah. movie is about the the, the the whole movie is about the contrast of the both of them but for every yin, there's a yang, and just how they come together. But it's also about similarities because he's from a broken family, she's from a broken family. You think he lives with a sister who's a single mother, yeah, and she lives with her father. And the, the mother's is the mother gone? Is the mother dead? No, the mother's there. The mother's, yeah. uh, you know, halfway through the movie, when the father's being investigated for tax fraud, or for, for, for turns out that he was stealing movie from or stealing um, money from old folks. Um, she has lunch with her mother and says, "Listen, if yeah, the if the right. police come to talk to you, can you 
you know, say something nice about him. But they are I mean, separate. Cause they maybe said, this, separate. Is the, this is the only thing I kept along with your mother. I remember it was at the ring. Well, that's the thing. The mother says to her, you know, you know, I was with your dad for a long time. There's things you don't know. Yeah. And as it turned out, her father, at the beginning, very nice guy, you know, has, he said, oh, this is what we've worked for. You know, this is all the sacrifices, all the holidays. Car. Yeah, he gives her a car for a graduation. Yeah. Then he gives her like a, a gold diamond ring yeah. because I'm your friend as well. Yeah. And it turns out that the dad, who was the manager and owner of an old folks home, has been stealing all the money from old, fe- old people as they were dying and stealing their jewelry and stealing their possessions and selling them. And is now being investigated by the the tax, the tax, the IRS. Yeah, um, uh, Mandy did say, Mandy did say that it was one of the most despicable characters he played, and he played a lot of bad guys. He played, like he's, he's remembered for, yeah, he's remembered for Fraser Crane's uh, lovable father, uh, you know. But he did, play, he had a record of playing some bad guys. Yeah, he played killers, and he said he never played. This was the worst character that he ever played because uh, almost psychotic. Because on one hand, he's, you know, he's the loving dad and he's the, you know, you know, this, everything is great and everything is amazing. But on the other hand, he's, you know, he's committing these absolutely despicable yeah. acts. And a matter of fact, justification for why, you know, I get what they say. I'm giving them a better uh, standard life than the families would have given them. And this is what I deserve. So he could he just, everything he's doing, he, he could justify it a hundred percent. So he does play it very well. I, I found him even in the car, and it was and that scene annoyed me where he's, he's, he's he gets the news that she's been got, got the scholarship to England, yeah. and he's singing the Steely Dan the dance song. I was just saying to you earlier, anybody who knows that Steely Dan song knows that next line, and he mumbles it. And I say, nah, but maybe it just adds to the type of character that he is. Maybe me and you just see too much. Yeah, maybe we, we nitpick just a little bit yeah, too I, much. I was watching it with a critical eye again last but night. But as as the, the 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 movie progresses and Diane falls in love with with lloyd he's he's you know he's over the moon the girl of his dreams the girl he's been dreaming about that you know he's he made his goal and finally she she's in love with him and he's telling all his friends you know that he, he is three best friends in the movie are played by girls and he's telling them you know we're going out with diane court mccourt and they're in the bedroom and they're saying you know lloyd is such a, a flighty character she's such a brain the brain should stay with the brains and you know and they all stop and say well you know, would you fall? You know, if you were Diane McCourt or Diane Court, would you fall for Lloyd? And all three of them say yes. And a lot of that cast were had. You know, it's a lot of nepotism in this movie because you have the the Cusacks in the film, then you have the producer's daughter in the films. Yeah, right? yeah. She played DC. Yeah, so Brooks. Uh, so it seemed to be a lot of uh, jobs for the boys in this movie. So John Cusack agreed to be in the movie. Just as a as a as a, a favor to her brother. Okay. She had just come off an Oscar nomination for Working Girl. Yeah. And so, if you, but if so, because of that, she she's not credited in the movie. If you look up the credits for Say Anything, her name appears nowhere. But if you look up the trailer for Say Anything, she's heavily featured in the yeah, trailer because so she had just come yeah. off the Oscar win. Good leverage. Yeah. Well, you know that's. Yeah, that is also another. Uh, Mister Homer Simpson is in the movie. Dan Castellanato. Yeah, yeah, that's a name I won't try and pronounce. And trust me, we did practice saying his name. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what you can learn on YouTube. But um, yeah, he's a role as a teacher a uh, long time before he became. Well, it wouldn't be that long, would it? 89? It wouldn't be that long before the season. No, because I can tell you also that um, the Australian release of Say Anything had a very, very early Simpsons short attached to it as like, I don't know, like a trailer or something. Yeah, they were drawn so well then, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> One of the Tracy uh, Ullman's that's shorts. Right, that's right, yeah. yeah. So, uh, as we said, you know, Lloyd and Diane, uh, they fall in love. It's getting very, very heavy. It's getting very, very serious. You know, they, they make love and, you know, he's over the moon. He tells his friends, you know, you know she, she goes straight home and tells her dad. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, because she's going to this, she gets her scholarship, she gets her grant, you know, and she's planning to go to the UK. She doesn't want to, she doesn't want to hurt him. She decides that she's going to break up with him. Yeah, and uh, she gives him a pen, which is... So, the, the breakup was pushed by the dad, you know, he said, yeah. like, you know, you can't focus on your, your studies if you're going out with a boy. And he just hands her a pen, says, give her a pen. She goes, I can't give him a pen. You're breaking up with someone, I can't give him a pen. But in the middle of the breakup, when she says, no, we should just be friends, and he just stops and he goes, what's going on here? Have you just broken up with me? And she, you know, in a last ditch attempt, at, you know, of saving the situation, she pulls the pen out and she hands him the pen. Because she didn't know what else to do. But in fairness, so 
later in the film he's on the phone to his sister and he's crying and the rain is pouring down and he just kind of whispers into the phone you know she gave me a pen I gave her my heart she gave me a pen was it a paperweight or a big no, it doesn't matter what it was a a big, it could, a paperweight. but that line was voted um, I'm going to say by Premier Magazine the number 73 line best line of a movie number 73 of all time by Premier Magazine yeah. so it's you know it's 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 iconic it is um but as we said i found it a bit tiresome i found it a bit i thought it tried too hard i thought it tried to be better than all those films that were around before that had gone before and but it didn't do any better really i think the only thing it has for me is like that kind of eccentric character but you look at like any of these films like michael c hall he was that kind of character but never got that kind of ability you think of 16 candles pretty in pink all these kind of older films so there's always a character like, like who was going pretty pink ducky he was in uh john Crow. john Crow, yeah so the, all them films had them characters i think they just expanded on those type of characters made lloyd and then i had like pretty similar what did he say that the only difference between this and pretty in pink is that the, was father, the was father was guilty. was guilty so like and even then it pretty i think John Hughes was just a master at it, and Crow just tried. Maybe he was forced by the studio. I don't know. So, take into account this was Crow's not his first screenplay, but definitely the, it was the first film that, that he directed. I, I kind of disagree with you. I, I think the the writing is is amazing. See, I don't. Sorry, I when I'm watching the movie, sometimes I watch a movie and I'll literally see them reading the script. It's that, you know, some, blah, blah, blah. like watching Mrs. Brown's boys and you know they're just reading. And I'm thinking, this, the script was too, some of the things were too, trying to be too cool and trying to say these things. You know, it, just for me, it felt too scripted. Too formulated. Yeah, it felt too scripted. I, I could nearly see them reading the lines. I could nearly see them rehearsing. But just for some of the scenes. And, like even the girl who, oh, you hate you. Like that really started to annoy me. But that, oh, that just, you know, is there anybody like that who would write? How many songs did she write? 63 songs 60, about a breakup yeah. with a guy called Joe yeah I know and I see the pictures like, all over the wall and like it's just like yeah and like, it was kind of kneeling on these things too much I know you disagree with me but as I said when it, when the film came out I was 18 you were a bit younger you were uh, 17 and a half and I, it didn't have that much of an impact on me so maybe I was a big fan of John Cusack before the film so I, I, at the time I probably would have rented the film based on him being in it mm. I just think and, and I still think even though he's He's kind of doesn't make as, as many prolific films as he used. I think he's just an amazing actor. And even then, and I, I know what you're saying about sometimes you, you can see like an almost formulaic scene where you can there with we are reading a script, but it's there's no passion or there's no life in it. I just think this film has just an amazing heart. I just think it's all heart. It, it's it's probably one of the, the best love stories I've ever seen put on film. Because he is just so unashamedly in love with her. But probably one of the most unrealistic love stories. Because he brings her to the party. And now he's, he's the key holder. And he's jumping around. Acting stupid with a big Mac on him. And dressed totally in a probably. She's dressed. Maybe she's dressed in a probably. Because she's not experienced going to parties. Because so the way she dressed up in a, like a night, uh, an evening dress. Or going for a meal. But he's way off doing stupid things. Pulling a car over like a 10 year old. But the reason she falls from him. Is not because of the clothes that he's wearing. Or his actions that night, right? He made you know. Why did you fall for Lloyd? What you know? One girl pulls him aside and said, you know, she said to, says to her like, hey, "What? How did this happen? What are you doing with him?" He made me laugh. Later in the movie, when she's talking to her dad, and he was saying like, "What, what is it? Like, what, you know, I, I can't. Can, can you quantify why you're you're with him?" She goes, "Well, you know, we were walking home, and he stopped me from walking because there was broken glass on the floor." I've never had anyone treat me with such, you know, um, caution. And it may, maybe that's you know, not a good way of describing, you know, smothering someone with love. But he, he in his eyes... Was, was he everything our father wasn't? Um, no, no, because the father, I think, was, was you know, obviously very... Um, the, it's mentioned a couple of times that we're best friends. The father invested in our future. You know, um, she's allowed to go to an overnight party. Oh yeah, like uh, I'll be back at dawn. Like she says, yeah, the you know, before it's very flippantly. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. yeah, like who would let their daughter say to you, "I'm gonna be back at dawn." Yeah, so that's the, and and that's what I mean. I, I no, I don't think the father was um was unemotional, but I just think that when she, you know, met someone like Lloyd, someone you know, far left of her normal, 
she you know eventually just fell in love with him yeah and uh, I suppose it's like all the good 80s movies that the love will conquer all in the end and it gets through all these barriers which you always try to enforce and had the Hollywood happy ending which I'm sure they insisted on would it be a better movie if they left each other and went their separate ways and then perhaps met up again a few years later Maybe, maybe, but I mean, you know, the, the movie ultimately wasn't that, like a happy ending, you know, it did book the trend in, in regards to that, the fact that like the, the father was being investigated, he was ultimately found to be guilty, he went, you know, he had to pay a fine of 125 grand and nine months in prison, she decided not to speak to him again, she, once, she, once she discovers that he in fact was guilty, I mean, she goes to the, the IRS office and she's saying to the investigator, like, what, what can I do? Why won't you leave him alone? And he said, look, he's guilty. I guarantee you, look in the house, you're going to find something. And she goes searching through the house. She searching presses. She's searching, um, you know, drawers. She doesn't find anything. She's all real emotionally sad with herself. I can't believe they made me, you know, uh, you know, I can't believe that they put doubt in my mind. You know, I know you're, you're innocent in her head. And then she opens one last, one last drawer. And you know it's a shoebox just full of dollars, and she is just heartbroken. Yeah, her, you know her her idol, her hero is you know he's a, a thief. So she goes to England and lawyer the company's her. Yeah, yeah, and that's the the fly off into the sunset. There was a TV show planned, and I was surprised it was. I thought it would have been I mean, kind of strike with the Iron Top, but it didn't make that much money. But probably. When it gathered momentum through VHS, DVD, and screenings. So, in 2014, they decided, or I don't know, Paramount or Fox or one of these, or whoever owns that they say anything rights, decided that they were going to do a, a TV show. But Cameron Crowe wasn't consulted. In fact, when he found out, he, he voiced his absolute disgust with it, said, you know, nothing to do with me. Uh, John Cusack said the same thing, nothing to do with me. I, you know, I wouldn't recommend it at all. And the, the, the writers that they had hired to develop the show went, no way, I'm not being involved in this at all. Um, there has been talk of, of, a, of a sequel. Cameron Crowe has said many times that he... Um, Cusack has agreed to do as well. He said he'd be well, interested. He, he'd be interested, you know, once the script was right. He, you know, he'd like to see where Lloyd is now. Yeah. And Cusack has said the same thing. Not really, a, you know, an extension of the love story, but just where would Lloyd Dobler be right now? I could imagine him walking in uh, Silicon Valley, sitting, punching over or something. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. I mean, the, the, the movie has such, it's got just so many memorable lines, memorable uh, scenes. You know, I, I, I probably watched the film 20 times over the years and I rewatched it again in, in preparation for this, you know. I said, like, I rewatched it and I, I, I struggled. I, I, it was irritating me and stupid things irritate me. And I shouldn't, and I was watching, I said, like, oh man, this is so annoying. Maybe it was in a bad, like, uh, uh, maybe it was a bad time to watch it when I watched it. Yeah. But like, it was not the type of film that I would have binged on over the years. Like, for me, Goodfellas is my movie that if I'm feeling need just to chill out, I'll stick Goodfellas on. It's the type of film Goodfellas that if it was on Tina G or Showtime, I'd still watch it, even though I have on every format. Yeah. So that's probably your say anything. So well, I don't know. I've got films now that would come above saying anything, but I just think that the, the structure of the film and. The unexpectedness of it sometimes, you know, they're having the dinner party, for example, and you know, they're the very well to do friends and family of his girlfriend's father. And he asks him, What do you plan to do after um, high school, Lloyd? So, well, honestly, I just plan to spend as much time as humanly possible with your daughter before she leaves. And he said, No, 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 I'm being serious. Oh, so am I. I'm being completely serious. And that's the, well, I'd imagine if you were visiting now, I said a divorce because no relationship could survive that. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> even again, I know I'm harping on about some of the, the structured classic scenes, but he's heartbroken and he's 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 walking around and he ends up at the back of the local Circle K or this. You know, that's circle, I know you're getting it. It's a good scene. It's a brilliant scene, and all his pals are sitting on the stoop having a beer, and you go, they're all saying, oh, "Man, oh, forget about her. She's useless. You know, we'll get you a new girl." And each and every one of them slate Diane. And he's sitting there, if you guys know so much about women, what are you doing at the back of the shops, you know, drinking at nine o'clock on a Friday? Yeah. And you could see, you know, the look of bewilderment and all the eyes. And one of them was like, it's by choice, man. It's by choice. Yeah. It's just And we brilliant. think we've all had, it's bravado by lads, you know, pretending to live a life that they're not living, you know. But I think 
A better version of this movie, to a degree, is Napoleon Dynamite. Napoleon Dynamite is a podcast on itself. Oh, well, we'll get to that. Yeah. But just to, I was watching it last night, and I'm thinking, do you know, Napoleon Dynamite is the movie that that could have been. Napoleon Dynamite, for all of its traits, is exactly the same. Yeah. The innocence, the heart, the simple yeah. story, the simple characters. Great soundtrack. Great soundtrack. Like I say, anything has an amazing soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah, it does actually have an amazing soundtrack. Like there is really good songs in Say Anything of the Creature there. There's like some high profile bands at the time that are still, I mean, uh, you know, Depeche Mode, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Cheap Trick, Joseph. Whitney Houston. <laughs> well, your man singing the very bad version of, of, of a Whitney Houston song uh, in Living Colour. And of course, we, you know, we, we, we couldn't do a podcast or we couldn't talk about the film Say Anything without talking about Peter Gabriel's. Um, in your eyes yeah I'd be a big Pierre Gabriel fan I even like when he was in Genesis but Soul was one of my favourite albums um, did he did he write that song especially for the movie or was it out there no already? no, it was already out there so the, the, the background was that they wanted a um, Billy Idol song um, to be a lover to be a lover yeah, yeah. To be, that was the song they wanted and then they kind of they you know they were changing it around a bit then they got some band called the Smithereens um, and they felt that the song that they wrote was, was almost listening to the song was giving away the plot of the movie. Um, the, and I think even if he used the Billy Idol, like that's saying what he wants to be. But like the, the Peter Gabriel song is more deep. It's a lot more deeper. Yeah. So the, the song that was actually playing is a, a song called uh, Bonin in the Boneyard. <laughs> yeah, that would have worked. By a band called Fishbone. And only the only reason they used the song was it was a you know it was a, a band that John Cusack was listening to. And they knew they were going to dub it over in, in, in the, in the uh, post-production. Uh, one of the singers on the soundtrack, Nancy Wilson, is actually married to Cameron Crowe. Yeah. And when they got married, Cameron Crowe put together like a mixtape, like an 80s mixtape of, of songs of singers that she liked. He was working in the office one night, had the mixtape on. And that song, Peter Gabriel, In Your Eyes, came on. And it didn't um, Cusack come out with a, with a boombox? At a Peter Gabriel concert a few, in the 90s. So, no, 2012 12, at the geez. Hollywood Bowl, Peter Gabriel. Yeah. And he goes, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce a special guest. And John, he didn't have the boombox up, but he walked out with the boombox in his hand. The crowd went mental. And he handed the boombox to Peter Gabriel. Yeah. He gave him a bell. Uh, Peter Gabriel put it up very, very quickly and then jumped into In Your Eyes. Yeah. I mean, when, when he, I've seen Peter Gabriel live, doing that song live. And when he does it live, it goes on for about 12 minutes. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a long song. But it's it's just iconic. Well, you know when they they sent when they wanted to get the song for Peter Gabriel, they sent him a copy of the movie. Yeah, but the wrong movie. Yeah. The wrong movie. Yeah. So he you know he he watched the movie. He sent back a letter back to the producer. Said absolutely, you can use the song, but I just don't know where my song would fit in in a film which is about drug abuse and someone dying at the end. I think what was going on? So inadvertently, mistakenly, Peter Gabriel had been sent a copy of Word. The biography Belushi. or autobiography of uh, James Belushi. Belushi, yeah, uh, um, yeah, no, a, a, a great soundtrack, which adds to it, um, but probably creates the to me. And this is the thread I'll hang around. That you have a great love for that song for whatever reason, and you, that toys that movie to you. But like, it's just been many great songs and great movies. That it, well, it's just heart. It's all heart. Yeah. You know, he, he, he's, he's saying to his friends, no, forget about it. I'm, I'm, I'm done. But do you know what, what ruins that scene for me now, having researched it even more? They weren't even on set together when that was filmed. No, he was standing in a field in front of a supermarket. Yeah, in a car park, and she yeah. was then doing that off in studio. But that's Hollywood. That's probably the majority of scenes in movies. But as I was saying, you know, he, he's, again, it's, it's the character of Lloyd putting his heart on his sleeve. And what... You know, it, obviously, it's a big, grand gesture. You know, we spoke earlier on about the, the Romeo and Juliet uh, connotation. It's Romeo beneath the balcony. You know, well, his sonnet. Yes, yes. <laughs> but um, he's wearing his heart on a sleeve. He's, you know, he's his last ditch attempt to get the love of his life back. I think it's a beautiful moment, and it's it it is still one of the most yeah. iconic images. You know, yeah, everyone knows it. Even if somebody didn't see the movie and you see that picture they'll know it's they'll know it's yeah yeah yeah. well i hope you enjoyed today's podcast i will watch it again and i i I will try and watch it uh with different eyes taking more of what derek said uh appreciate your support thanks for listening and as kieran said you know thanks for for tuning in where the the podcast is getting great traction it's available on 
a couple of different uh, podcast platforms, uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Podcasts, Spotify, the links, we publish the links on our Facebook page, uh, Let Christy Take It. Uh, please, you know, visit, like, write a review, let us know what you're thinking. Uh, we are overwhelmed by the support that we're getting at the moment. Uh, you can find Let Christy on Twitter, at Let Christy on Instagram. Uh, soon to be on YouTube. We're going to start uploading the podcast on YouTube. No videos, though. I, no videos. I have to start wearing clothes, then. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, you know, we're, we're, as I said, we're absolutely overwhelmed, and we can't believe the traction that we're getting. And it's great to have a, a, some sponsors on board. We have a couple of sponsors lined up to, to sponsor the episodes. Yeah, no, we have. And uh, again, keep your ideas coming in. Um, and try and watch Say Anything this weekend and let us know what you think. Or uh, do you agree or disagree with anything that we said? And as we said at the very beginning, for all your wedding needs, go to fabweddings.ie. Do you know what? If Lloyd and herself had a went, that would have been a great wedding. If they... Lloyd and Diane contacted fab weddings i'm sure robert at fab weddings would especially if they mentioned let christy take it robert would take exceptional care we've, of we've sold our souls we've sold our souls thanks very much bye I got a question. If you guys know so much about women, how come you're here at like a gas and sip on a Saturday night completely alone drinking beers? There's no women anywhere. By choice, man. That's yeah, right, man. It's a conscious choice. It's a choice, man. Choosing to be here. I don't want to be here, man. I'm choosing it.